Order. It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Well, thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. We now know that Hydro One has signed a deal to make $50 million worth of payouts to U.S. energy executives. It never stops. The Liberals are once again missing in action as the latest hydro ripoff occurs. People are struggling to pay their bills. Families are deciding whether to heat or eat. Mr. Speaker, how can the Liberals be prepared to spend $50 million worth of payouts to U.S. energy executives? Golden Parish. Thank you. Acting Premier. Good morning, Speaker. Minister of Energy. Sure of energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Everything in that question, Mr. Speaker, is not accurate. Hydro One customers have not paid one penny, not one penny, to U.S. hydro executives at Avista, nor will they in the future, Mr. Speaker. Doug Ford doesn't seem to know what he's talking about when it comes to this issue, Mr. Speaker, or any issue, and which is troubling from a self-described sound businessman, Mr. Speaker. Either that or he's deliberately trying to talk to something that is not accurate for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Regardless, Mr. Speaker, that is not true. In 2017 alone, a U.S. company that Hydro One has purchased a Vista turned a profit of over $115 million U.S., Mr. Speaker. Salaries and severin pay payments do not come from Hydro One customers. As the opposition should well know, this acquisition of Avista will not cost Ontario customers a dime. In fact, Mr. Speaker, this acquisition will benefit Ontario customers, employers, yes, and shareholders, and rates in Ontario will not be impacted. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. You know, Speaker, uh, they can say all they want, but the Liberals read the same documents we read where the Avista executives said they will now be able to spread their costs yeah. over their new Ontario uh, partners. Exactly. That's the Ontario ratepayers, Speaker. Yeah. Deep and buried uh, in the document is a series of U.S. securities filings where the evidence is absolutely clear. The secret millionaires club at Hydro One would be making $50 million worth of payouts to their U.S. energy executive counterparts. First, Hydro One changes their own severances, adding in a $10 million poison pill, and now, secondly, they agree to pay out $50 million to their U.S. Uh, coal company. Wow. Mr. Speaker, are these U.S. energy executives Question. really worth another $50 million? Oh, another $50 Thank you. Million. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, the question isn't accurate, Mr. Speaker. Hydro One customers have not paid one penny to actually uh, U.S. hydro executives at Avista, Mr. Speaker. Nor will they in the future. You know, in fact, Mr. Speaker, this acquisition will benefit Ontario customers, employees, and shareholders, and rates in Ontario will not be impacted by this purchase, Mr. Speaker. Similar acquisitions are increasingly common practice for Canadian-owned utilities, Mr. Speaker. This includes, for example, both Newfoundland and Labrador-based Fortis, the purchase of Michigan-based ITC, and Edmonton-based EPCOR utilities, purchase of two U.S. water utilities, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, one thing, uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Ford admitted last week, but unreported by his per personal media team, was that his headline-grabbing plan to fire the CEO and board of Hydro One doesn't affect hydro rates directly, Mr. Uh, Speaker. And that was said at the Thunder Bay rally, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, thank you. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. As usual, Speaker, the Liberals say one thing, but in this case, the U.S. securities tell us the real truth, Speaker. Their filings reveal that the Hydro One management and board have authorized more than $36 million in payouts to the top five managers of their U.S. energy company, and an additional $14 million in payouts were authorized to another eight Avista executives. This is all part of an arrangement that is explicitly referred to as a golden parachute. Golden parachute. Oh. Speaker, this is literally a golden parachute. The worst part about this is that at the same time this government is mailing out disconnection notices. They are agreeing to a $50 million wow. payout. Mr. Shame. Speaker, does the Liberal government Question. support this golden parachute? Shame.
Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, he's making it up as he goes along. Hydro One is actually extending the actual disconnection ban, Mr. Speaker, until further into June, Mr. Speaker. So they don't even know what to talk about when it comes to Hydro One, Mr. Speaker. What they're talking about with a Vista as well, Mr. Speaker, is absolutely not true. As I said before, and I'll say it again, Mr. Speaker, Hydro One customers have not paid one penny to U.S. hydro executives. To add a vista, Mr. Speaker, nor will they in the future. This is common practice when similar acquisitions that have been done with Canadian uh, Canadian owned utilities. This includes, for example, Mr. Speaker, when Newfoundland and Labrador's based uh, Fortis, when they purchased Michigan based ITC, and when Edmonton based Epcord Utilities purchased two U.S. water utilities, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to advocate yes, and work on behalf of the people of Ontario. They can continue to make things up as they go along, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, Service Employees International Union's Working Ontario Women have started running ads attacking the opposition. Oh, oh, Mr. Oh, Speaker, oh. is this their thank you to the Liberals yep. for handing over control of Ontario's home care agency? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Speaker, Ontario Minister of Health Proud. and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm very pleased to speak to uh, uh, <coughs> our new agency, our plans for a new agency uh, to look after those uh, small number of uh, home care patients with chronic and complex uh, situations uh, that require one-on-one -on -one care with a really trusted PSW. Um, this is a model that has been very successful in a number of jurisdictions, and uh, uh, I certainly uh, believe that it's going to add to our spectrum of services for people who do require home care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. Looking at the SEIU-backed model used in the U.S. reveals some staggering results. The media stories were extensive. Currently, there are lawsuits in each of the states where this model has been adopted. In the end, the SEIU was also charged for concealing political contributions. Oh, Mr. Speaker, wow. are the WOW ads SEIU's wow. way of concealing donations to the Liberal Party? Wow. Wow. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, as it relates to this uh, uh, type of self-directed care, we know that Ontarians want more control and choice over their home care services, and that's why we're introducing two new innovative self-directed care models that patients could opt into. Of course, this will be entirely voluntary for both clients and for PSWs. Um, one will provide home care clients with the funding to purchase services in their care plan or to choose the people who will provide these services. So so again, this uh, opportunity for people to have a choice, I think, is, uh, is something that uh, uh, the vast majority of people would be very much in favour of, and I really find it very difficult to understand the opposition's uh, reluctance in this, uh, in this regard. We're piloting these programmes in some three local health integration networks. I'll have more to say Answer. in the final question. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. Final supplementary. Uh, back, thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Deputy Premier. Well, the Liberals didn't listen to the people yet again. This SEIU-backed home care agency doesn't make any real sense. Providers are against this. Patients are against this. The workers are against this. But the SEIU is in favour of this. So, Mr. Speaker, will the government order the Minister of Health to cancel this SEIU backed agency as their final as her final job as minister. That would be very good. Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> we are certainly committed to uh, piloting uh, this particular type of program uh, as part of the roster of services for home care patients where they require a particularly close relationship with their uh, personal support worker. And so we did consult widely, and after careful consideration and feedback from the sector, uh, we made sure that there would be uh, no disruption to the existing system. It will be in parallel to our existing home care system, and it will serve a small, targeted client population uh, compared to the, uh, uh, the more generally available services. 
services. So these new initiatives will be evaluated for cost-effectiveness, meeting patient need and patient outcomes to ensure the programs work for our clients and for PSWs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Question? The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. A few weeks ago, the government issued a request for qualifications for the Regional Express Rail project. Once again, the government is using costly private financing. The Auditor General said private financing and procurement is vastly more expensive than traditional procurement, with no evidence of value for money. But we also learned that the Premier plans to sign a long-term operations contract. When did the people of Ontario vote to hand over the Go Rail system to a private investor for 30 years? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Economic Development and, and Growth on behalf of Minister of Transportation. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Thanks very much, Speaker. I, uh, I know this particular member from the NDP asked a transit question last week, and uh, perhaps he's decided to come back with Suddenly a follow-up because uh, well, yes, in some respects, because perhaps there's sudden interest, but also, uh, also, Speaker, perhaps he didn't like the answer he received last week with respect to the unprecedented <coughs> amounts that our government's investing in transit. Speaker, in all of my time here in this legislature, including a stint for three and a half years as the Minister of Transportation, it never failed to amaze me that Ontario's NDP, who purport to want to see more transit expansions take place in Toronto and elsewhere, would consistently vote against uh, moves by our government yeah. to make those Shame. unprecedented announcements. Regional Express Rail Speaker is a $13.5 billion <laughs> transit expansion that this province, the likes of which this province has never seen before. And I would have thought for a party that uh, suggests that it is progressive from time to time, I would have thought that they'd want to support this initiative, Speaker. It's really clear, it's yes, really sir. clear to me that they don't, based on the kinds of questions that they've been asking on this topic just here in the last couple of weeks. And Thank you. I'm looking forward to the next two rounds of this, uh, this question. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm not surprised the minister doesn't want to address the question of privatization. The Liberal government privatized the hydro system and sold off Hydro One without a public mandate. This helped the Premier's Bay Street friends and Liberal campaign donors, but it has hurt Ontario ratepayers and the public. So why is the Premier doing the exact same thing with public transit? Minister. Well, Speaker, and I can certainly understand why the NDP member from Toronto Danforth wouldn't want to talk about the unprecedented amount that we are investing in public transit. Speaker, you know, I got to tell you, just a few days ago, the Premier of our province signed an MOU with the City of Toronto, and in Budget 2018, there was a significant amount of money that was contained in the budget to help deliver on projects that I know constituents in Toronto Danforth want to see built. So, for example, funding in our budget for the Toronto Relief Line Speaker, funding in our budget for the Young Street North subway extension, funding in our budget speaker for more transit options in Scarborough. But he asked a question about Regional Express Rail Speaker and also Waterfront LRT. That's the other project I should mention as well. Speaker, he talked about Go Regional Express Rail. Why in the world would Ontario's NDP not want to yes, see two-way yeah. all-day go service right. with trains running every 15 minutes, Speaker? It's beyond me. Wow. I would have thought they'd want to stand and applaud this initiative. Maybe they'll have a chance. In there. Final supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I think it's entirely clear why the minister doesn't want to touch the word privatization because he knows what impact it has. He avoids the question profoundly. The Liberals could have modernized Ontario's hydro system without selling it off. Instead, they signed inflexible long-term contracts with private financiers, locking Ontario ratepayers into decades of high prices. Now the Premier is doing the same thing with public transit, locking Ontario riders Ontario riders into a long-term private contract for the Go Rail network. She's already sold off Hydro One with no public mandate, added billions in private profits onto Ontario Hydro bills just to help her Bay Street friends and the Liberal Party. Why would she make the exact same mistake with public transit? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, after four years of opposing every single initiative designed, uh, initiatives taken by our government to design to expand public transit, it's not at all shocking to me to see that member from the Toronto, from the Toronto area, from the NDP caucus, on the eve of an election campaign, trying to make up for lost time. Unfortunately, Speaker, 
I know people who live in Toronto Danforth, and I know they want to see the Toronto Relief Line built. Our government's helping to build it. I know people who live in Scarborough want to see more transit options. Speaker, our government is funding the initiatives that will help provide that transit for them. I know people who live in Willowdale and Richmond Hill, and they want to see the Young North subway extension get built. Speaker, that's what we're doing. In addition to that, Speaker, on Go Regional Express Rail, two-way all-day go service, 15 minutes, trains will be electrified, expanding to Niagara, expanding to Bowmanville, making fares more cheaper, running the Union Pearson Express at over yes, capacity sir. because it's so popular. Speaker, our government opening a subway in Vaughan last December. Speaker, our government has built, expanded, and plans to. Do more in transit Thank than any, any other government in history. I would have thought the end. Thank you. No question, the member from Windsor to come see. Speaker, my question is to the acting premier. Good morning. Good morning. The um, lack of affordable housing, speaker, is squeezing young people out of the neighborhoods where they want to live. Major cities are becoming segregated by income, divided into rich and poor. Ontario needs more affordable housing. The Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada says that even after signing on to the national housing strategy, Ontario will still need to build an additional 45,000 affordable housing units over 10 years. So why has the Premier committed exactly zero additional dollars to new affordable housing investments for the current fiscal year? Thank you. Acting Premier. The Minister of Housing. The Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. And I appreciate uh, his uh, long advocacy for affordable housing, and that's why I'm puzzled why he isn't uh, congratulating our government on all the steps that we've taken to uh, to enhance affordable housing over a number of years. Our investments in uh, affordable housing, focusing on those who are chronically homeless and those who are in danger of homeless, where we've prevented thousands of people from falling into homelessness, and we've brought uh, many homeless people into permanent homes with supporting housing. Our, uh, our commitment to establishing uh, an inclusionary zoning regime in this province and uh, our uh, delivering on that and giving broad-based inclusionary zoning powers to every municipality in this province so they will be able to yes, partner with the private sector and build more affordable housing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, maybe the minister wasn't listening to the question. Even after signing on to the national housing strategy, there will still be a massive gap between the supply of new affordable housing and what is needed. We still need to build an additional 45,000 new affordable homes over 10 years. But the Premier has provided no additional funding this year for the construction of new affordable housing. And if and when money eventually starts flowing under the national housing strategy, it will still not be enough. Why has the Premier failed to provide a plan to fill this remaining gap? Thank you. Minister? Well, Mr. Speaker, indeed, I did listen to uh, the question, and the member should listen to his own question, because the NDP platform speaks to 65,000 units of affordable housing, but does not speak to how they're going to pay for it, Mr. Speaker. So our plan uh, does uh, include additional funds through the National Housing Strategy, $250 million in additional funding in early years. We've secured uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, renew renewable funding through the end of agreements with the federal government to ensure that our existing stock uh, continues to be well maintained. And, Mr. Speaker, through our Cap and Invest program, we're providing $647 million to social housing providers across this province to retrofit existing housing and ensure it stays open for those families who need it. Mr. Speaker, we are putting our money where our mouth is. We are funding yes, it. The NDP platform is silent on how they will fund Thank their you. promises. Supple final supplementary. Speaker, the minister should read the platform. The NDP believes that people have the right to a home that is safe and affordable. That's why we have committed to building 65,000 new affordable housing units over 10 years. Why won't the Premier make the same commitment? Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, I'll say once again, 
I, I applaud the NDP uh, for coming forward and supporting affordable housing. It's unfortunate they wouldn't support our budgets that provided funding for it. Yeah, where but are you I, I have reviewed their platform, and they do not speak to how they will fund their promise. But, Mr. Speaker, we know the Conservatives have no position on affordable housing other than perhaps whatever secret. Uh, secret deals that uh, Doug Ford has done with the development industry. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we're committed to building affordable housing. We spend over a billion dollars on affordable housing each and every year, and we will continue to do so, and we'll work with our partners and municipalities and the federal government Answer. to deliver on more affordable housing, Mr. Answer. Speaker. Thank you. Your question. The member from uh, Whitby, Oshawa. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Speaker, the York University strike is now entering its third month, wow. impacting more than 51,000 students, careers, and the many parents supporting them. Speaker, over 7,000 students were expecting to graduate in June. Speaker, this strike has now gone on for over two months. Why? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, this, um, this situation is very much at the top of our, our priority list, Mr. Speaker. We know that the students at York University have been impacted by this strike, and the, both parties, Mr. Speaker, have been asked to consider consensual arbitration, Mr. Speaker. Um, Bill Kaplan introduced his report last Friday. I spoke with both representatives of each side, Mr. Speaker, to, to recommend that they follow the commissioner's report a neutral party, a very experienced mediator arbitrator in this province and in this country has examined the situation, Mr. Speaker, and uh, has concluded that the parties are at an impasse and that the way forward is through consensual Answer. arbitration. And that is exactly what we are encouraging them to do and that we are asking them to do, thank Mr. You. Speaker, so to bring this to a close. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills De Development. Speaker, in a matter of hours, hours, the writ will be dropped and will be in an election. Speaker, more than 51,000 students' careers have been put on hold by this strike and by this government. Why didn't the Liberal government take two months to finally act? Mr. Speaker, you can see the question that has been asked by the PC party, Mr. Speaker, that there is no respect for collective bargaining process on that side of the House. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we respect the collective bargaining process. We respect the, the opportunity and the rights of each side to come to an agreement that is the best deal that, that is had is at the table, Mr. Speaker. We're doing very well today. Just to let you know. To reach that deal, it requires a compromise on both sides. Because if you're thinking about the interests of the students, if you're thinking about the impact that this strike has had on the students, it requires a compromise on both sides. And that's why we are calling on the both parties yes, to enter consensual interest arbitration to bring this dispute to a close and get students back into the classroom where they belong. New question, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Speaker, my question is to the acting premier. In Ontario, we are facing a crisis in child and youth mental health services due to a lack of funding by this government over the past 12 years. We know that 70% of adult mental illness begins in childhood. By the age of 40, half of all Ontarians will struggle with a mental health problem. Yet today in Ontario, kids have to wait up to 18 months for treatment. Will the acting premier take immediate action to ensure kids will no longer have to wait for services? Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Children, Children and Youth Services. Minister of Children and Youth Services. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member uh, for the uh, the question. 
Uh, the member knows that um, over the last several years, uh, we've committed to a process uh, called Moving on Mental Health, where we've uh, gone out across the province and uh, talked to uh, uh, many different agencies, and we've built a, a whole new system with lead agencies uh, in, uh, in different regions across the province. Uh, there's 33 uh, lead agencies that will exist. Uh, I think currently we're at 32. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, move forward in Toronto. We have East Metro Youth Services, and what they're doing is really coordinating the services. So um, there's a single point of entry, and young people get the services that they need and that they deserve. Thank you, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Just this morning, the Canadian Institute for Health Information released its latest data on children and youth with mental health. The no um, numbers are absolutely shocking. Between 2006 and 2017, there has been a 72 percent increase in the number of kids seeking help in hospital ERs and a 79 percent increase in the number of kids being hospitalized. This is happening because they have nowhere else to turn for help due to this government's failure to properly fund community-based mental health services. When will this government finally provide children with community-based mental health services when and where they need it? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to take a, rec uh, a minute to recognize um, uh, Kim Moran from uh, Children's Mental Health Ontario, who is here joining us. I want to thank her for her advocacy, uh, working hard on behalf of families here in Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what's shocking is um, uh, the fact that both the Conservatives and the NDP, when it comes to their mental health investments, actually uh, would result in cuts in the system. You know, what we've done, Mr. Speaker, is we've made a commitment uh, to put $2.1 billion into mental health services over the next four years in comparison to what the Progressive Conservative Party has actually put forward. I believe it's the 1.9. And if you look at the history of funding, 1.9 billion over 10 years, and it would actually end up being a cut in the system. It's unacceptable, and we're going to make sure that families get the resources they need when they need it. Thank you. New question. The member from Etobicoke North. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development. Our government is committed to work with Indigenous communities throughout the province as we embark on the journey towards reconciliation. In the report from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one of the many important recommendations was to ensure that revenues that the, provinces, that the province receives from natural resources are shared with local Indigenous communities from whose lands the resources of course were taken. Speaker, last week the government took an enormous step forward on that journey and announced a resource revenue sharing arrangement with several First Nation communities throughout Northern Ontario. Speaker, my question is this. Can the minister please give us details about how these arrangements were uh, arrived at and how resource revenue sharing will benefit First Nation communities across the province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Thanks so much, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Otobago North for that very, very important question. And he's absolutely right. Uh, our government has worked tirelessly for months with uh, the communities represented by Grand Council Treaty No. 3, Waban Tribal Council, and Meshkegawak Tribal Council to provide 45 percent of forestry stumpage fees and 40 percent of mining here, tax here. and royalties earned from active mines in the traditional <laughs> territories of our partners. And, Speaker, the communities involved uh, certainly couldn't be more excited to begin sharing and the prosperity and, and uh, wealth that will now be available to them and hasn't been in the past, and we look forward to more people joining. What, if I can give an example, Ogeechee Daw Francis Cavanaugh of Grand Council Treaty 3 said, the Anishinaabe Nation in Treaty 3 has long awaited to receive and become partners in resource revenue sharing and moving towards acknowledging the treaty. The forestry and mining resource sharing agreement with the province of Ontario is an important step towards more meaningful discussions yes, on reconciliation, economic prosperity, and continued improvement in relationship building between the Anishinaabe Nation and the Crown. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I think all Ontarians appreciate the, the Minister's leadership on this journey towards reconciliation. And, Speaker, particularly, for example, learning about how the Waban Tribal Council uh, believes that this is, in fact, a culmination of decades' worth of work on behalf of, of the province and, of course, their own leadership. 
Speaker, as parliamentarians, we know that major agreements like these do not happen overnight, and the path to reconciliation isn't begun at a podium or, by the way, on a bumper sticker, and you can't fire your way to reconciliation. <laughs> Speaker, on this side of the House, we know that it takes thoughtful deliberation and respectful cooperation on behalf of all parties involved and willing partners, of course. Speaker, my question is this. Can the minister please elaborate on the, the negotiated process and share further how these historic agreements will benefit all Ontarians and particularly our First Nations communities? Sure, minister of Northern Development Mines. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Sure, Natural Resources and Forestry. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to my colleague for this very good question well and all esteem to continue to do the good work of reconciliation and negotiating these agreements. Speakers, I think the, the teams of both ministries worked really hard with our partners in the, on the Indigenous side to come up with these agreements, which are truly the right step on the path to reconciliation. Indeed, if I want to quote uh, Jason Gauthier, who is the chief of the Misanabi Cree First Nation Mushkegawa Council, and I'm going to use his words because they are quite telling. Resource revenue sharing is a step in the right direction toward reconciliation. Our communities are continuing to take steps toward the long-term goal of achieving financial independence and sovereign wealth. We as communities can be ambitious in achieving our goals while retaining our position as the stewards of the land and the first people of Turtle Island. So I think I want to recognize how important this uh, engagement with uh, uh, our First Nations uh, communities was in achieving this process. Indeed, yes, jo John Batiste also uh, was calling this uh, announcement a step in the right direction, and I'm very proud that on this side of the House we are committed to reconciliation. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Speaker, the emotional and financial cost to Ontario families and businesses has skyrocketed due to the lack of funding and support for children and youth mental health services by this government. In fact, Mr. Speaker, according to Ipsos data, 25 per cent of Ontario parents are missing work because they are concerned with their ch child's mental health. When will this minister take immediate action to help children in Ontario and address the growing crisis in children and youth mental illness in this province? Thank you. Minister of children and youth services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as I mentioned uh, with the earlier, uh, the earlier question, um, you know, when you compare the progressive conservatives uh, approach, their platform to uh, um, finding solutions and supporting families when it comes to uh, mental health, their actual investment is much lower than what we're currently investing and far below what we're proposing to invest in the future. Mr. Speaker, $1.9 billion is actually a cut to the system. Over a 10-year period, based on inflation and other factors, it would actually be a cut to the system. And those cuts will result in a lot of people losing their employment and providing services for people. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, this is the party opposite that is proposing to cut $6 billion from the budget, and we know where that's going to come from. Jobs. Mr. Speaker, Answer. my ministry alone is a $5 billion ministry. What are you going to do, just get rid of children and youth services? Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, that uh, response was an insult not only to the children and families of this province, here, here. but to Chief. Kim Moran, who's here in the House today, who's been Chief. an advocate for children's mental health for years upon years. Fifteen years you've done nothing with children's mental health, and the statistics are showing it. Mr. Speaker, the data released today, it's been a 72 percent increase, the number of Chief. young people going to ERs for mental health concerns. That's up from last year, 69 percent. Mr. Speaker, it's 79 percent increase in the number of young people being hospitalized Shameful. when all the other data for youth are going down. Mental health is going up because this government Money has ignored it, and it's only because of an election they're deciding to maybe announce to do something about it. It's pathetic. How can the people of this province trust this government any further? It's time for a change. Will the minister commit, commit to actually following through on their plan today? Mr. Speaker, when it comes to this government, we've always stood up for children and families here in the province of Ontario. 
And you know what's unacceptable, Mr. Speaker? What's unacceptable is the track record of the party opposite. This is a party, when it comes to children and youth services, that made massive cuts to the system. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we know when it comes to children and our efforts that we've put forward, for example, to put forward free me medicine for children, that party voted against it. When that party was in power, Finish. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to supporting children, we know it's that party and their leader who clearly said, when speaking about children with autism, they can go to hell. I don't care. Yeah. Oh. The minister will withdraw. New question. The member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Sixty youth justice workers in Hamilton, some who have joined us here today, are out on the street, locked out by their employer. Despite the fact that Errol Youth Detention Centre houses 16 young offenders, the direct employer is not the Ministry of Community Safety and Corrections but Banyan Community Services because the previous Conservative government partially privatized the youth justice system, and the Liberal government has continued to do so. The issues at stake are a demand for concessions in their benefits and a 20 per cent premium on their benefits. These frontline workers average $10,000 a year less than their ministry counterparts. Shame. Despite the fact that Banyan's CEO was on the Sunshine List, $150,000 in 2017. We're not talking about widgets idle on the line here, Speaker, but vulnerable youth who've been displaced by this lockout. Question. What is this government going to do to right this ship? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Sure. Children and Youth Services. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I want to take a moment to recognize the uh, men and women uh, who work uh, in the youth justice sector here in Ontario for the extraordinary work they do every single day. And Mr. Speaker, uh, in the supplemental, the Minister of Labor, Labor will uh, weigh in on a, a couple of points. But I just want to say that, you know, when we're talking about the success within that sector in regards to, you know, supporting young people, we've seen a 75% decline in any uh, type of uh, uh, interaction with uh, youth uh, facilities. Um, we've seen a 43% uh, drop in uh, uh, youth uh, uh, charges in the province of Ontario, I believe, over the last 10 years. So we're seeing some drastic changes and those changes come because we have men and women who are dedicated to uh, making sure that young people have opportunities so again just on Answer. behalf of uh, the government of Ontario I want to thank every single one of them for the hard work they do every single year thank you supplementary well speaker these workers are not looking for acknowledgement they're looking for fairness these justice workers housing provincial young offenders they don't even have Work, workers' safety insurance. That is like shameful. Despite the fact that Banyan CEO is on the sunshine list, these youth just, justice workers, they're willing to bargain, they're ready to go. Seeing as this employer's privatized contractor providing services on behalf of the Ministry of Community Safety and Corrections, on behalf of this Liberal government speaker, what is the acting premier? the former Minister of Community, Safety and Corrections, after 15 years in power, going to do to improve the situation for these workers. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker Ontario, as I've said, I've, 
Um, I've risen in this House on a number of occasions. Ontario's got an excellent track record when it comes to labour relations, Speaker. The collective bargaining process is one that we respect. It results in a settlement 98 per cent of the time, Speaker. 98 per cent of collective agreements are reached by the parties at the table, Speaker. From time to time, Speaker, groups need assistance, they need arbitration, they need things like mediation in order to overcome some hurdles to reach that settlement. Ontario's got some of the best arbitrators, some of the best media in the world, Speaker, and they've got an excellent track record too. I know that the uh, we have mediators in with the parties speaking as I speak, uh, and they're involved. What I would urge is for both parties get back to the table. Let's get an agreement reached with the assistance of the LOL of the MOL mediator, yes, Speaker, and let's get these people back to work. Thank you. Thank you. No question. The member from Barry. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children and Youth Services. Minister, child and youth mental health is so important. We know that many young adults with mental health problems report that their symptoms began in childhood. And I can tell you as an elementary teacher, I have seen it in, in the schools. This is why it is so important that services are available to children and youth when they need it and where they need it. As the minister knows, with our government's support, the Royal Victoria Regional Health Centre in my riding of Barrie opened their child and mental health wing back in December, which will help over 300 inpatients and 3,000 outpatients every year. Minister, could you share with us what else our government is doing to support the child and youth mental health sector? Thank you, Minister of Children and Youth Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member uh, for the question and for the great work that she's doing in her community to support families. Again, I'd also like to uh, just take a moment to thank CHMO, uh, who are here today. Uh, our government and this party is committed to historic investments when it comes to mental health, and your advocacy has played an incredible role in getting us to this point. So again, thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, we're going to invest $2.1 billion over the next four years uh, to mental health and addiction. And our goal is to ensure that no matter where someone goes uh, for the first time, that they uh, experience a mental health, uh, when they experience a mental health issue, we want to make sure that they get the care that they, uh, they need, need and the care that they deserve. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, we're investing an additional $570 million over the next uh, four years. Uh, it's an incredible yes, amount, sir. and Mr. Speaker, just that investment is more than what the Conservatives have uh, put forward over a 10-year period. Um, we're supporting um, <laughs> local and provincial priorities, including taxes. Your mic's off. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and thank you to the Minister. This commitment will truly improve access to mental health services and go a long way in helping identify and treating mental illness as early as possible. This is what we need to be doing, investing in care, not cuts. This is a commitment that is not being matched by the parties opposite. Minister, can you talk more about why this investment in care is so important to the people of Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, this, uh, this uh, announcement uh, is about uh, care over cuts. It's uh, very clear that the NDP has made uh, a commitment to uh, mental health, uh, but it's, uh, it's actually, uh, I would say, a cut as well. The Conservatives uh, under Doug Ford have uh, just dusted off uh, Patrick Brown's uh, People's Guarantee, and they've brought forward a $1.9 billion dollar investment, which again is not enough money for the system, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this represents a $1.2 billion dollar cut in mental health services over the next four years compared to our plan, Mr. Speaker. And we need to make sure that, again, that every young person in this province uh, when they have a mental health challenge, will be able to go and get the service that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. My question this morning is for the acting premier. Uh, Speaker, the Ontario Liberals' failed and destructive energy policy means that almost 600 people in Sudbury could be on the verge of having their power cut off, shut off. Uh, they, they may have banned winter disconnection, Speaker, but years of disastrous electricity policy that's caused hydro bills to go up by 300 per cent means 
For many Ontarians, for thousands of Ontarians, the bills keep piling up. So, Speaker, why is the Premier continually making the Millionaires Club at Hydro One bigger when people in Sudbury and other communities across the province are having to choose between paying their grocery bill or paying their electricity bill? Thank you. Minister of Energy. Your leader, Sir, Energy. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was our government that brought forward last winter our legislation that bans winter disconnections, Mr. Speaker, and we've worked with all utilities to make sure that that happened. And then now, Mr. Speaker, that that ban is ending for many of these utilities, not all, but for some, Mr. Speaker, that they're continuing to work with individuals to let them know that the programs that are there, Mr. Speaker, the ones that we put in place, the ones that they voted against, Mr. Speaker, that help low-income individuals, that help First Nations individuals, Mr. Speaker, that make sure seniors seniors actually can save more money on their electricity bills. Those are the things, Mr. Speaker, that we did to actually help. We rebuilt the system, we made it affordable, we made it clean, Mr. Speaker, and it is reliable. It is something that they actually, Mr. Speaker, voted against continuously, and we will continue to advocate for and work on on behalf of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the minister gets up and he bellows about all of the plans that are in place. But do you know why those plans are necessary, Mr. Speaker? It's because of the disastrous energy policy of this minister and this government over the last 15 years. We have amongst the highest hydro prices in all of North America. That's why they've got to put in this unfair hydro plan, Mr. Speaker. Finish, please. Speaker, the price of electricity under the Ontario Liberal government has increased by 300 per cent in parts of— uh, I thought I might be able to get through this. The Minister of Advanced Education come to order. Finish, please. Speaker, if it's so fair, if it's so fair, how come thousands Question. of Ontarians can't afford to pay their electricity bills and are about to get cut off? Mr. Speaker, what is the government going to do for those people? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we've made sure that uh, we brought forward the Fair Hydro Plan, which I know that they're actually using, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that because they had no plan, Mr. Speaker. So our plan is so good that they're keeping it, Mr. Speaker, and I understand that. So you know, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to find programs that will work to help people, Mr. Speaker, because under this government, we've never had a blackout that lasted three days. Under that government, Mr. Speaker, they did. You know what, Mr. Speaker, we've made sure we've invested in a system that is now reliable, clean, and affordable, Mr. Speaker. There is no more coal being used in our electricity grid. We are 96 per cent GHG free, Mr. Speaker, and I know they want to change that. I know they want to change that, Mr. Speaker, because you know what, Mr. Speaker? They have no plan. They have no ideas. All they do, Mr. Speaker, is meet with developers in the back room and talk about paving things over rather than thinking about the people of Ontario. New question, the member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for. Start it. I'll finish. The member from Chatham Kent Essex, come to order. And I will go to warnings if I have to. Let's just keep it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the acting premier. Nurses Association of Ontario and the Ontario Nurses Association held a joint press conference this morning on the first day of Nursing Week. Happy Nursing Week to my colleague. ONA and RNAO came together to draw attention, the public's attention to a critical issue facing Ontarians. Ontario hospitals have 10,000 yes, 10, vacant RN positions, not because they cannot recruit more RN, but because our hospitals don't have the money to fill the vacant RN position. Their message is clear. Patients are not receiving the care they need. Hospitals are, on average, short-staffed by 17 per cent, with occupancy rate well over 100 per cent. Question. Will the Premier admit that it is her government who created this crisis in our hospital system? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Health, Long-Term Care. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And our government is really proud to have stood alongside nurses since we took office yeah. in 2003. Yeah. And of course, we want to recognise the contributions of all our nurses in the system. And happy Nurses Week to the member for Scarborough Agent Court and uh, the Minister of Transportation. Uh, obviously, we're very aware of the incredibly important work that nurses do in uh, our hospitals and in all sorts of different settings across uh, the province. Uh, so we have, since we took office in 2003, more than 30,000 more nurses that have begun work in Ontario. Wow. Just over the last year, 1,200 more nurses employed in Ontario compared to last year. And we truly recognize how crucial they are to our health care system. Yep. And we're continuing to support nurses in many different Answer. ways, including supporting education for nurses by committing $4.9 million towards critical care training for our nurses. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, Ontario has the lowest RN to population ratio in the entire country, and the trend is getting worse, not better. The government has had 15 years to improve this situation, but instead they have made things worse. This after the Conservative government laid off 60,000 nurses, closed 28 hospitals, 28,000 beds when they were in power. RNAO and ONA state that the research is clear. RN care reduces the incidence of patients' complication, like pressure ulcer, pneumonia, cardiac arrest, fall, sepsis, infection, medical errors, and the list goes on. Yet, the Wins government decided to give zero base budget increases to our hospital for four years in a row. The first step in solving a problem, Speaker, is to admit that you have a problem. Question. Does the minister agree that it is her government that has created those problems in our hospitals? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have increased hospital operating yeah. budgets year over year, and in particular in this budget, this which I hope the member opposite will join 100%. us on this side of the House in supporting, we're making an investment of $822 million for Ontario hospitals that will help our nurses serve their patients even better. And so, of course, we've made an additional investment in our, through our budget uh, of $300 million over three years so that every long-term care home in the province will benefit from an additional registered nurse. We've expanded the scope of practices of nurses as well, and, include, and we now have 27 new nurse practitioner-led clinics, which means faster access to family health care for more than 60,000 patients in communities across the province. We truly value the contribution of our nurses, and we will continue to support them through our budget, and I yes, hope sir. the member opposite will vote with us on that budget. Yeah, thank you. Your question, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the minister responsible for early years and child care. Minister, I know that our government is committed to making sure families have access to high quality, inclusive and affordable child care. Under Doug Ford's plan, families will receive a rebate of just $34 per month. This proves how out of touch he is with the needs of families on the ground. In my riding of Kingston and the Islands, I have heard from families that they face challenges when it comes to the affordability of childcare, and I want to know what our government is doing to address this. Minister, please tell us what supports will be provided to help families struggling to access affordable, licensed childcare. Thank you, Minister of Education, Minister responsible for early years and childcare. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands for this very important question. Mr. Speaker, Doug Ford's child care plan actually winds up to be nothing more than a scheme to cut $1.3 billion out of our child care plan for Ontario families. Think about that, Mr. Speaker. Ontario families have told us they need help when it comes to child care. Instead, Ford's massive cut to our child care commitment will leave families with little support. In fact, just slightly more than a dollar a day. Our plan is for free childcare for preschoolers until kindergarten. This major commitment will save Ontario families an estimated $17,000 per wow. child. Or That's in addition to the $6,500 they will save in kindergarten. Instead, Doug Ford's tax rebate will save families just $34 a month, and they'll have to wait a full year to apply to try to receive Answer. it. Speaker, we're building a solid foundation for the workforce, spaces for families. Doug Ford's plan will not reduce fees not build Thank spaces you. and not make childcare more affordable. Thank you. New uh, supplementary. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you so much to the minister for that answer. And I have to say what a pleasure it has been to work with you over the course of the, this past session. Our commitment, our commitment to free childcare for preschool-aged children is a historic step in transforming the way childcare works in Ontario. I am proud to be part of a government that cares and is committed to providing support for families that need it. Can the minister please expand how our government will be able to introduce such historic change to the child care sector? Thank you. Yes, sir. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the member's question. Speaker, work is already underway to build more spaces and grow the workforce for this massive commitment, and we have the track record to do it. To offer free preschool childcare, there must be enough spaces available for children to access that care. So, we are already building 100,000 quality licensed childcare spaces over five years. In fact, we're creating more than 34,000 of those spaces right now. But we're not only building spaces, Mr. Speaker, we're also ensuring we have the tens of thousands of early childhood educators we'll need to look after our kids. And beginning in 2020, a wage grid will improve compensation for all ECEs and program staff. This will align wages with those working in full-day kindergarten. Mr. Speaker, it's about fairness and equity. Speaker, by building the spaces, investing in the workforce, and providing families with free preschool childcare, yes, we're transforming the system. Our plan delivers care, not cuts to childcare. Thank you. New question. The member from Bruce Gray, Owen South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Acting Premier. Your Minister of Community and Social Services cut off supports for a 38-year-old woman with Down syndrome when she left Ontario to spend time visiting her brother, who is in the Royal Canadian Air Force. But your government delivered an even bigger disappointment to the family when they returned home to Neustadt in my riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Sherry Carnes sadly found herself among the thousands of interns with disabilities you waitlisted for passport funding. No one knows when Sherry's funding will arrive. She could be on the waitlist for three years or even longer. Acting Premier, is waitlisting the best level of care you can give a severely disabled interun? Minister of Community and Social Services. Um, the member opposite can uh, can let his constituent know that help is on the way. Uh, in our recent uh, budget proposal, we put forward uh, an increased amount to uh, passport. That means every single person on the wait list will receive passport funding at a minimum of $5,000. This is a, uh, a pretty significant step uh, for uh, people in Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, it's interesting, you know, coming from the Conservatives who, when they were in power, they cut uh, developmental services by 22 percent. Wow! You know how can how can the member stand up and defend a record or an approach by a conservative government that attacked the the most vulnerable people in our community? Mr. Speaker, uh, they should rethink their strategy when it comes to supporting uh, people with developmental disabilities. Because the, on this side of the house, we believe Answer. that every single person should have the opportunity uh, to have some type of funding. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Back to the acting premier. Terrible answer. Well, Minister, Sherry's parents are very distraught by your government's actions. First, you punished their daughter for spending time with her brother by cutting off her supports, and then you waitlisted her for passport funding. But you see, the disappointment with your government didn't stop there. On March 28, your Minister of Children and Youth wrote the family to say, "We tabled the 2018 budget. For the first time in the province's history, every eligible adult would get at least $5,000 a year." Ken and Nancy's immediate question was, and this is their words, is this a trick? They called the regional DSO office who knew nothing about your $5,000 token letter which they received. And so they could only draw one conclusion. And again, this is the words of the parents of a child who was waitlisted after many years of having services. Acting Premier, is your government seriously bribing the people on waitlist with $5,000? Just so you know, for the party, June The member knows better, and he will withdraw. Withdraw. Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's uh, awful. It's interesting. Uh, the member brings up uh, um, uh, one of our, uh, our 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 budget's pieces, which is, I think, an important piece. 
and that $5,000 is, uh, is something that we're proposing in our budget. And I would just uh, say to the member opposite, he has a choice to make when he's voting on, when, he's, when he votes on the budget, the you're either going to vote Gray for it or, or against it. Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I just want to mention that this is the same party that cut 22% out of developmental disabilities and cut over 20% for people on social work. Uh, social Ontario work, sorry. Could you imagine a political party in this country cutting 20, over 20% 20 to our most vulnerable people? Shame. should be ashamed of themselves. Shame. On this side of the House, we believe in investing they in people in Ontario. They and let your constituents you. know that help is on the way. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Education. Year after year, Francophone children in the East End of Toronto are assimilated in local English schools because their community lacks a French language high school. Anglophones in the East End of Toronto have high schools with sports fields, auditoriums, and many amenities. No such high school facility is available to Francophone children. Article 23 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms gives Francophones in Ontario the right to schools that are equivalent to those of the local English majority. Will the minister uphold the charter rights to equivalence and ensure that the Francophone kids in the East End of Toronto are not treated as second-class citizens? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we recognize the tremendous advantage students have when they speak more than one language, and that's why we are supporting the vitality and sustainability of the Francophone community. So, Mr. Speaker, we have increased annual funding for French language boards by 25 per cent since 2013, which is more than $340 million. To me, Mr. Speaker, that says commitment. We also know that in the east of Toronto, families are looking for French education. Education. And so that's why, since 2013, we've provided $208 million in capital funding to CSV Amont. And we also recently announced this year, Mr. Speaker, that we are providing $80 million to support nine capital projects for French language boards. And, Mr. Speaker, I do want to say that the member from Beaches East York has been a strong advocate for these schools. And I want to point out, including more than $16 million to be invested in the Viamont School Board to support the creation of a new French high school Thank in you. Toronto. Supplementary. Again, to the Minister of Education. Minister, the only school on offer for Francophones in the same neighbourhood lacks a sports field, has fewer amenities, and is landlocked on less than an acre of land. On April 30th, Premier Wynn publicly stated that the government must always ensure that support is in place for minority communities that will allow them to have equal success. Given the realities of assimilation and the equivalence requirements of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, given the need for the province to provide leadership to defend those rights, given the Premier's commitment, what will this minister do to uphold the Charter Rights of Francophone secondary students in East End Toronto? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for this question. Once again, we recently announced this year that we're providing $80 million to support nine capital projects for French language boards, including the $16 million to be investment, invested in Viamont School Board. But, Mr. Speaker, I just want to point out that the member opposite would have us think that, frankly, students in the French language board are not doing well. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that enrollment is increasing. In fact, in 2016-17, over 105,000 students were attending French language schools, and test scores continue to rise. Over 76 per cent of students in French language schools have met or surpassed the provincial standard in reading, writing, and math, and on grade 3 EQAO. For grade 6, tests over 81 per cent of students have consistently met or surpassed the provincial standard. Yes, Mr. Speaker, all this to say those students in the French language board are doing extremely well. I'm very proud of the work of the educators Thank in you. that system and proud of our investments. Thank you. Good. Point of order, the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Speaker, very quickly, I want to mention that Paige Colin Robinson of Kitchener Centre has his grandparents here today, Rose and Doug Robinson. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. Welcome. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.